I was, I was cautioned that these will pop if we get too close. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so hey, welcome to summer in San Francisco. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here, y'all. We're really glad to have you. You've been living in LA for a couple of years, but I know I and probably everybody else here thinks of you as a New York City guy. So tell me how you're sort of adjusting to life in Los Angeles. Well, I'm definitely a, a New Yorker to the to the grain, but sometimes I think you always got to change your polarity in life. You know what I mean? So I came out to California, you know, caught a nice vibe, nice creative vibe, and uh, got me a house in LA. And so I'll be out here for at least five years doing the do in California, yo. You have a swimming pool? I got a pool, yo. <laughs> <laughs> I got a pool, yo. All right, we're gonna get to the work you've been doing in LA, the composing work for film and some of the acting in a little bit. But I just wanna kind of start a little bit further back. You came from a family of 11, 11 kids, right? Yeah. Single mom, Staten Island. And by the time you were nine years old, you were already on your own riding the subway to 42nd Street to see kung fu movies. Yeah. And those apparently had a really profound impression on you and, and all the work you've done since then. Can you tell us about who that young Robert Diggs was and what that whole experience was about? Well, I think being um, one of 11 children, you know, it's not a lot of attention you want to get on yourself, so you got to find things to occupy yourself and keep yourself busy. And uh, I first started with comic books and things of that nature. But well, one of my cousins took me to 42nd Street and uh, showed me one of these kung fu films. It just blew my mind away. And I wound up playing hooky to go see them and just really became infatuated with it. And I think that um, you, know, you never know how your future is going to turn out. You just jump into things like, and just try things. But it happened to be something that seemed very negative at the time because I got caught by the truant officer. I got chased by the truant officers and even you know, locked up into detention. But um, I just had this unsatchable urge to see these kung fu films, and to think that years later that these same things that I lusted so much would eventually help, you know, my hobby would become my creative, you know, output and feed my family, yo. In all reality, so um, it was pretty, pretty weird and pretty strange because in New York in those times it was like a lot of heroin users and glue sniffers, <laughs> and you'd be in a the movie theater sitting beside, you know, one guy nodding, one guy sniffing. Maybe one guy trying to, you know, have sex with a girl, and here I am, nine, ten years old, watching these, watching these films and really absorbing them. What was it about the kung fu movies that really turned you on and made you such a fan? What was it? I think the first thing was just to escape reality itself. You know what I mean? You know, the, the things they were doing in those films, such as jumping over buildings and, you know, fighting one man against ten men and so much honor. Those things at first just had, had, gave me a chance to escape reality. And, uh, you know, not, you know, I know it's a lot of poverty people in the world, so, you know, we're worse cases than me, but we basically had two bedrooms, you know what I mean? My mom's room and the kids' room. And you got four kids in the bed and four kids in the bed and, you know, and so much struggling for attention and, and certain things, you look for escapism. And so for a moment, these things were escapism. Back then, for fifty, you could see three movies, so maybe I would go to Pathmark and pack up some bags and make, make a dime a bag and eventually pack up enough bags to make a dollar fifty, cut school, and go to movies, you know what I mean? Um, which, you know, I wouldn't want my son to do that at all, trust me, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but for me, yo, it really, it really paid off, shall I say. So you were already drinking smoking pot when you were that age, nine? Yeah, I had my first joint at the age of nine. Uh, have, uh, in New York, we have a Hispanic community we call Puerto Ricans, right? And um, <laughs> we've heard of that. <laughs> but a Puerto Rican girl, you know, is just so pretty and so sexy and so like kind of leads you on type thing. And, uh, oh, that's how it worked. <laughs> yeah, it's like so hanging with them and and and, and, and you know, it just I just lost my mind. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you first started sampling and mixing records, a little bit later, you were couple years, maybe 11. Yeah. Where did the music come from? Was it your parents' record collection? Where did you get the music and what kind of stuff were you working with? Um, when I first started um, DJing, I think first I started rapping first, writing lyrics and things like that because uh, I had a cousin named the Jizza, a genius, who um, was about a few years older than me, so he was already into hip hop. He'd been to the Bronx, Soundview Projects. He picked up the hip hop trade. He brought it back to Staten Island. He showed me and I became infatuated with it. But by the age of 11, we were selling newspapers and hustling and making our own money. I recall making my first $60 and 
and buying what is known as a technique straight arm turntable. Uh, ODB bought one, I bought one, and we stole a mixer. ODB's and, your cousin. <laughs> <my> cousin. <laughs> your cousin ODB, old dirty bastard. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> but um, um, I mean, the records will come from anywhere, whether it's from your mom's collection, the neighbor's collection, uh, if you could get money, you save up, you buy the break beats or the hip hop records that was out at that time. We, you know, that, that, in those years, it was more like a expedition to get a sound. I mean, you would travel from Staten Island to Brooklyn, all the way to Queens, or anywhere where you heard a record store had such and such a record. You know, there was an old thing called the uh, Super Disco Breaks that uh, it's hard to find them, but you may find them in stores like Amoeba and things like that. But we would travel from Staten Island to Manhattan to Queens just to find volume one, volume two. You would just cut these records all day, you know what I mean, and make your little demo tapes. And that was at the age of 11. Wow. You know, there's a certain amount of freedom you had as a kid in New York because the subway system is so great. You could <laughs> yeah. go everywhere. I think the subway system really uh, helped a lot of kids in New York get a chance to explore, you know, things outside their community. Um, I actually grew up in Brooklyn first before I moved to Staten Island. Uh -huh. I want to make that clear. Um, and Brooklyn is definitely, you know, the subway trains run through the city like veins. So you can reach any part you want. But on Staten Island, it's more secluded. There's no subway train. There's only the, the Staten Island ferry to get you across to Manhattan. And when I moved out there, I became more and more isolated, you know what I mean, from the rest of New York. So it gave us a chance to kind of to develop ourselves and to zone into our own selves. And then you would take that ride across to Manhattan. It was more of a harder trip at that time. Mm -hmm. Jumping ahead to 1992, not a good time for you. You were on trial for attempted murder. You were looking at an eight-year sentence. And it seems like that was a real turning point in your life. Um, it changed you, that experience. Um, Tell us about that. Well, definitely, um, you know, um, it was one of those years. It's actually, the, the, it started around 91, where, you know, we just kind of got heavy into the street game and kind of, you know, lost ourselves to the fast dollar, shall we say, and uh, got this uh, alter, altercation with some, some young men, you know, over girls and things like that, and it just escalated itself up to a violent situation. And, um, um, you know, I wound up, you know, having to go to jail for a little while. Um, got myself out on bail, fortunately, but uh, wound up going to court, going to trial, and was facing eight years in prison. Um, but at the same time, I had a daughter being, you know, in the womb, about to be born. And I just, you know, just took a look at myself like, yo, you know, I'm about to do the same thing that every other statistic black man do, which they say by the age of 25, we dead or in jail. I mean, so I must have been 21, about to go out of jail. Matter of fact, I may be even 20, so I was about to you know, make a record out of it. But um, um, when I, you know, when I went to the trial and I, you know, it was, it was a case of self-defense. You know, it was five guys, they was really kind of aggressive and real egotistic and they wanted to do the do. I was prepared for the do, you know what I mean? Defended myself. And uh, when I went to trial, I, I won on self-defense. It was a long shot, you know. I mean, I recall, uh, I recall the, the DA telling me, um, you know, if I plea, plea out, you give me 60 days or 90 days or something like that. So I said, yeah, I, I plea out. You know, I, I go 60 days, 90 days. And then he changed his mind, you know, because he found out I was from New York. He thought I was more like a, some kind of kingpin or whatever. So he made it his, his business to, to nail me. And it was his, his dedication to destroy me that saved me because he went, he went through any means necessary to make me look like the kind of person that I really was on the inside. And the truth showed out that, you know, I was just a young guy in a bad situation, made a couple of bad decisions, but overall had a good heart, had a, had a, had a brain on my head. When I got a chance to, you know, to speak to the jury and tell them my story, they understood the situation, let me go home. Wow. And uh, my mom looked me in my eyes, she said, um, boy, this is your second chance. Don't mess it up and don't turn back. And I never turned back. So, so six months later was when you six put together Wu-Tang Productions, production company, yeah. which was remarkable for a lot of reasons and seems to have drawn from so many influences and important things in your life, starting with these kung fu movies. The, the uh, Wu-Tang, the clan drew a lot from martial arts. So tell us what it is from that discipline that kind of helped the Wu-Tang clan well, come into being. Well, um, at first, you know, um, you know, you, you watch the martial arts films for the action. But maybe around 1989 or 88, shall I say, I started watching them and like listening more. And some of the things they were saying was very philosophical, very profound. 
For instance, uh, the five tones deafen every ear. You know, the five colors blind every eye. You know, when you first hear that, it don't sound like nothing. But when you think about it, it's like, you know, you take things on face value. And so therefore, you can't see the inner meaning of things because we take it so much what we see openly and, and what we hear audibly without thinking about the, we produce that sound, we produce that color. You know, there's no such thing as color, actually. It's, it's all one color, but it's broken down through the prism. So those type of things started hitting me inside, you know what I mean? It started affecting my, 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 my whole psyche. And when I, and then the brotherhood that the, that the martial art movies had, the brotherhood of, you know, if, if he, if, you know, he'll sacrifice his life if you were a better man. If your name was Hong C. Kwan and you was a hero, I seen movies where a guy just met him, never seen him in his life, just met him, heard his name, Hong C. Kwan, I got it. And he'll fight the rest of the guys off and die, and his wife would die. So Hong Si Kwan could live on another day to fight the government or fight oppression and help the people. And those kind of morals wasn't really showed in black movies or black TV or, or even white TV when it came to, to me as a young man. Only could get it through the Asian cinema, you know what I mean? And I just absorbed it when I took it to uh, the rest of the Wu-Tang brothers and it was like, yo, we the Wu-Tang clan. You know what I mean? We, <laughs> well, we, that was, we that's a sword, all. actually. Yeah. Wu-Tang is a sword? Yeah, but well, Wu-Tang is, Wu is, a, um, is, a, um, is a mountain in China where, um, it, it, where they develop internal martial art. And their most famous style is their sword style. Uh -huh. And being that we were lyrical rappers and your tongue is like a devil-edged sword, as we recall, you go to the book of Revelation, it says, when Jesus spoke, out of his mouth came a devil-edged sword, and with this sword, he would smite the nations. I just took that literal and applied it to myself and applied it to my crew, and we felt we was the best lyricists in the world, you know what I mean? And we felt we had our brotherhood title. So we became the Wu-Tang Clan. But it wasn't easy. A lot of guys in like, you know, in Stapleton, which is a very, very tough neighborhood in Staten Island, Stapleton is known for stick-ups. Like, you go out there, you're going to get beat up, robbed, and sent back. And Park Hill was more known for guys who dressed fly, had ballets, polo, had cars, you know, drug dealers type guys, right? But to come with Wu-Tang and not be Oriental, you know, I had guys and they were like, you want that Chinese shit, man? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They was... And I was like, nah, you don't understand, yo. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's all one culture. It just separated over time. So there was this heroic ideal, and there was this idea of loyalty that was really profound. And when did you start training with the Chinese fighting monk, the Qigong training? Was that during oh, this time, no, or was no, that no, much that was later? Way after. I actually met Sifu Xi Ming in 19, 1995. Oh, much after later. After Wu-Tang had um, already made, it, made, made their name for themselves. But meeting him was like a vision and a dream come true because Sifu Xin Yang if anybody heard of him, he's the 34th generation Shaolin monk whose life story is pretty ironic itself. He was a young man who was about to die, very sick, and he, his parents took him to a fortune teller and said, yeah, your son will die unless you take him to the temple. So they took him to the temple at the age of six and they left him there. And they went on about their lives, you know what I mean? He grew up in this temple and he told me he slept on ropes you know, he did so many things that, you know, we would take for granted. He went through so much things to be the Shaolin monk, and he studied so many different philosophies and trainings. But um, he still felt that he was kind of suppressed also. And when he got his first chance to come to America, he came to San Francisco yeah. <laughs> with the rest of the Shaolin monks, and he looked around, and he never went back. He, he, did, what he, he did what was known as defected. He defected from communist China, and stayed right here in San Francisco in Chinatown in somebody's uh, restaurant in the basement for uh, three months with no light. And he finally uh, got out by 93, made it to New York in 94, and I met him in 95, and we became uh, brothers from another mother, but he also became my Sifu. Sifu teacher? Yeah, Sifu means teacher. Okay. So martial arts, because we're talking about sort of the formation of the Wu-Tang Clan, the other... The other uh, inspiration, it almost seems at odds with the martial arts, and I want to hear you sort of explain this, came from organized crime. Right. The structure. You actually modeled yourself after Vito Corleone in The Godfather. Be and Vito. I'm kind of going, okay, <laughs> <laughs> martial arts here, organized crime there. So tell us how that kind of works together. Well, actually, it's very similar. If you look at somebody like Vito Corleone, who was different from the rest of the, the mob bosses. You know, you watch The Godfather and you watch this family go through the things they go through. It, it, it was very inspirational to, uh, to me, Raekwon, all my whole crew, because uh, Vito was a man who had a good nature about himself. And, um, and you know, he did things that, you know, he, he was a criminal, but he had a heart. And, and sometimes you gotta do whatever you gotta do to make a dollar and things like that. But if you keep your morale straight, 
You know what I'm saying? You can become a great man even in crime. And so, so you know, we were street kids and we were into crime, criminal activities and doing a lot of wild things. So to, pot, to, to, to put ourselves after Vito Col Colion, you know what I mean, was, was, a, was, a, was an honor for us and a great thing to do. So we incorporated the mafia philosophy, which is also brotherhood, loyalty, trust. I mean, if you talk, you know, you get whacked. You know what I mean? You, you can't mess with nobody else's wife. To this day, you know, you go, to this day, if I go to Method Man's house, I, I don't even look his woman in the eyes because, <laughs> because I wouldn't even disrespect him like that. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, so certain things, you know, these movies instill into us that I think was very, you know, very, very powerful. I think it could help any young man. And we just took it and meshed that all together. Then you had the 5% um, nation mm -hmm. and the supreme mathematics. And like, this is something, just a little bit of, that I've learned right. reading about you and your background that we could talk about for the rest of the night. But for those people here who don't know anything about that or what kind of um, framework that provided for you, give us a little bit of well, information. The mathematics, as the 5% as the nation would call it, when they say 5%, right, the original meaning they had was that out of all the people in the world, only 5% of the world knew the truth, lived the truth, teach the truth. There's another 10% of the world who also knows the truth, but use the truth against others and trick knowledge and ways like that to manipulate the other 85% who are just sheep to be led this way or led that way. They say uh, at any given moment, we could take 100 people and it'll be five out of that 100 that's gonna really be pure people. Maybe the other 10 are wise, but they're using their wisdom to make hustles off it. Um, that was the original meaning of it. What it did for me, it's called getting knowledge of yourself. And getting knowledge of yourself is the key to life. If a, if a man don't know himself, he can't know nobody else. If a man don't respect himself, he can't respect nobody else. When it came to the supreme mathematics, the first thing they taught us was knowledge, which is one. And that means to look, listen, observe, and respect. No matter what you do, you walk in any room, you do the knowledge. You look, you listen, you observe, you respect where you at. Then you act upon it, which is wisdom. Wisdom is just a manifestation of knowledge. It's just the action of knowledge. But knowledge is what's contained within you. So those principles actually saved my life dozens and dozens of times because I'm able to take a look first or listen first before I just jump out there, you know what I mean? Most people, especially young urban people in our community, we do things first and find out later, you know? If a kid knew, if a kid knew the results of his crime or the results of his actions ahead of time, or we knew that 20 years of smoking weed is gonna cut your life 20 years short, you know what I mean? you may not do the same thing, you know what I mean? So knowledge is very essential and very important, and we learned that uh, from the Nation of Islam, so I say. Which brings us right directly to chess, because you're describing chess, right. which is planning ahead and not jumping in, and that fits into the mix as well. In see, fact, you were talking about it before we came on stage. See, and the beautiful thing about chess that um, I learned as time went on is that chess is based on the 64 squares. And you go back and study the I Ching, which is basically the diagram of the universe that the Chinese had developed over 4,000 years ago is based on 64 trigrams, the 64 symbols. And with these 64 symbols, they're able to calculate a man's destiny, the destiny of the universe, in fact, whether it's the earth atmosphere, the, the weather, they're able to do these things by knowing that things change based on certain times. So, so this 64 number on, this, on, the, on the chess set became more and more important to me over the years. And I think that chess is one of those games that if anybody who plays it, they, they become a little more smarter than somebody who don't play it because they, they plot in the head, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's maliciously or whether it's beneficial for everybody else, it's still a plot ahead. So you still play regularly? Yeah, I just played yesterday yeah. and got beat by the jizzer, but <laughs> <laughs> I well, still go at it, yo. Well, we got to get back to the music because that's why everybody here knows you. You sold your first million records, you say this, before you became a musician yeah. and then started studying musical theory and learning to read music and all of that, which is pretty remarkable. So tell us about that journey and how that happened. Yeah, I mean, starting off as a New York City DJ and having a lot of break records and records that was rare and people wasn't into it no more, you know, and, you know, and having this SP-1200 sampler and this ASR sampler, I was able to just to take bits of sounds to, um, to make my own music. I think I was one of the first people so, um, you know, a lot of guys were sampling music and making loops, but I was taking bump, one noise, spreading it across the whole keyboard, and then playing that one note, because I, I didn't know what a C note was. But I would take one sound and, uh, and spread it across the keyboard and just make all these different sounds come together. 
and that formed the Wu Tang sound. But as I became a platinum selling artist, and you know, you travel around the world, you meet people, you meet musicians, and a lot of musicians would come to me like, "Yo, we're destroying music." It's like a drum machine. I mean, a drummer can't get a job. When you sample the beat, you sample the bass line, I mean, a bass player can't get a job. So you guys ain't real musicians. You're just destroying music. And they was really, you know, against, against what I was doing. And, I, and, I, and I'm a type of person that I love, you know, to, to be right. I love to be real and right. And so therefore, I was like, you know what? I'm going to take this time to study music then. I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to go to another musician and disrespect his trade like that. Because it is a trade when a man takes five to 10 years to master an instrument and he can't get a job, but here go a guy who don't know nothing about an instrument making millions of dollars, you know what I mean? That so, could hurt. So what I did, you know what I'm saying, I paid respect to the music. I went back and studied the theories of music, went back and taught myself piano. I'm teaching myself guitar now. I taught myself the percussions and things of that nature, and that helped increase my sound. When I made the album called Wu-Tang Forever, um, that was the first example of me knowing exactly what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? And, and, it, was, and, it, and it was like this on some critics. It went up and down. But it was me paying homage back to musicians and showing them that, yo, look, I'm a musician as well, and I respect this craft. But you say, so I learned music, but that's a long road. I mean, you don't just learn music. It takes a long time to learn music theory and to read music and particularly to write music. Yeah, it took, it took, it took a very long, I mean, to write it, I just started probably writing two years ago um, as far as writing to where somebody else could read it, you know what I mean, legible. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a serious thing, yo. Um, but with the knowledge of music and, and the kind of producer that I am, it, took, it's, it helped me go to even more heights to the degree to where now I can add to my resume a composer because I know how to compose music now. I know how music flows. Um, I studied Peter and the Wolf, for instance. Oh, yeah. I first did the movie Ghost Dog. I wrote a score for Ghost Dog, but I studied Peter and the Wolf. And when I studied that, studied that uh, suite, they would call it, you know, he took every instrument and he applied an instrument to a character. So when the birds came, he played the flute. Okay. When the wolf came, he was like, Wrong. he threw the trombone in there. When you watch Ghost Dog, and when the movie first come on, the bird is flying, you hear my drum pattern with a flute on top of it. So, so I took the time to study those things and also to intervene them or intertwine them into my own style. When did you first start using the detuned piano? Oh, I think I started using a detuned piano in 93 because I didn't know what a tune was. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It was more like I stumbled across that, but I liked it so much. There's, there's a great musician, I'm quite sure any musician would know, named Thelonious Monk. Oh, yeah. And there's a film he got called Straight No Chaser. And I searched for that film for three years. Um, from 1992, I found it in 1995 in Chicago, I found it. And um, I actually had collected Thelonious Monk music in 92, I bought everything he made on, on, from Blue Note, shall I say. And then I maybe paid $500 for all this music. And I was just listening to this guy, listen to him, listen to him, listen to him. And I was like, man, this guy is crazy. And also there's another great pianist named Bill Evans as well, who also I studied under, I studied his music, shall I say. But when I saw the film Straight No Chaser, and I seen how this man would smoke a cigarette, hit the keys, walk away from the key piano, <laughs> get a drink maybe, <laughs> come back and still be on beat, you know what I mean? Still be in his zone. I mean, I kind of felt like, okay, he understands what I understand about music. There's no form to it. I said, music is like more like a pulse. And when you got a pulse, you could change the pulse based on what the vibration is going with it. So you listen to old Wu-Tang music like Method Man, which is going down, 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 down. It's just a basic four notes on the same pulse, but the drums are changing. So with the change of the drum, it changed the pulse or vibration of the key. And that's how I think I was able to make these sounds come a little different that attracted uh, fans. Okay. I want to talk for a minute about your identities, because you've had a lot of them. You mm -hmm. were born Robert Diggs. You're the RZA. You were Prince Rakim. You were Bobby Digital. Uh -oh. So <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> let, let's just, let's take Bobby Digital. I knew, you knew I'd say that, didn't you? Man. So you... You, you were on top in 1997, right? You had, uh, that was Wu-Tang Forever. Yeah. And um, I've heard you describe this as a time in your life where you got into the ego thing. And it seems like a lot of that discipline that you developed and created slid away. Yeah, put it to the side, shall I say. What happened, I think, what happened to me personally was this, yo. When I first made Wu-Tang Clan in 93, you know, you know I'm crowned the abbot of Wu-Tang, I mean. And, this, and you're dealing with a, you know, not just the eight members of the group who the world knows, but all their homeboys as well. I mean, 
maybe hundreds of kids and brothers, you know what I mean, that look up to me like, yo, that's the Abbott, you know what I mean? And so I never got to, you know, I kind of like didn't finish doing it, doing my thing, you know what I mean? So when Wu-Tang became famous, you know, everybody, you know, they go on the road, guys was having fun, drinking, smoking, just really having a real party. And me, I was more like very solid to myself, very solid to, very observant, more like applying wisdom, studying wisdom. I was more into like studying and things like that. And, uh, and then after that, it was more successful, the Cuban link, the liquid spores, return to the 36 chambers. I basically lived in the basement for three years straight. I didn't even know I was a millionaire until 1997. It was the first year that I came outside. Um, we actually came to California. You know what I mean? I was hanging with all kind of movie stars and the women was just bong, bong, bong. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of funny because I was more like uh, the type of person that never, never, never uh, dealt with infidelity, never, no girls on the road. I didn't touch no girls for maybe three or four years of my, of my first career. Where well, you see guys coming out three or four, the ODB, five girls a night. You know what I mean? I was more like, you know, very contained. Um, and um, and I, share, I haven't shared this, I didn't share this in my book, but I'll share this with this audience. In 97, the love of my life actually forsake me. Mm. And uh, that was like, man, very, very puzzling. You know what I mean? Especially when I'm being righteous and I'm trying to do the right thing. So. Once I was forsaken, I was like, man, party. You wanna see who could party? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I will never forget the day um, that I walked out that house. I caught a flight to LA. And from that day on, I was on a mission. And Bobby Digital was born out of that. How long did that last? That lasted for about two and a half, maybe three years. You went through a little money? Yeah, oh man, I went through a lot of money, yo. <laughs> it ain't nothing to brag about, though, because you know what I mean? Foolish, it's not, not, never to brag about foolish things. I mean, you're young, you gotta experiment, you gotta have fun, you gotta zone in. But, um, you know, I could have fed a lot of other people with that money, yo. I fed Donald Trump because I stayed in the Trump Plaza for like <laughs> months with a whole bunch of homeboys and we turned, the, we, we, turned, we turned the Trump Plaza to a project building. I promise you. <laughs> one, one day, this is true, this is a true story. One day, Patty LaBelle was going in and it's four of us on the stoop of the Trump Plaza with 40 ounces. <laughs> so you know, we, we zoned out. Oh, that would make a great ad, we you zoned, know? We zoned out. <laughs> so the other thing that you did that was so extraordinary was create this business model, and again, it hadn't been done before. All of your um, Wu-Tang Clan members signed with one label, and then you allowed all the individuals to sign with the other label, other labels, plural, yeah. which was kind of a brilliant strategy because you were all competing against each other and selling more records, selling more music. Yeah, my idea at that time, this is before Bobby Digital, my idea was um, to have the industry work for me because I had a bad experience in the music industry back in 1989 with the Prince Rock King and the Tommy Boy thing. Because, you know, it's always whoever's hot, record companies want to kind of model you towards that person. 1990, 1991, who was the hottest artist in the world? MC Hammer, Young MC, those type of guys. And I'm from New York and we more like, we not like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can't dance, I can't dance a leg, yo. But, um, but when I, so when I came with a whole crazy album of, of you know, of hardcore music, you know, I made one song for the girls, which is Oh We Love You, I Came, based, based on my own things I was going through, couldn't choose between some women I was dealing with. So I wrote the song and Tommy Boy, we love this song, this is the song. And we're gonna put you in a tuxedo and we're gonna put you out there like that. And I was like, you know, anything to get on, you don't care, you know, 19 years old, you're like, okay, cool, yo, <laughs> let's do it. And um, it, was a, it was a bad decision. And, and at the same time, the Jizza, who was my teacher, was facing the same dilemma over at Cold Chillin'. Cold Chillin' got Big Daddy Kane, Cool G Rap, Biz Marquee, and they know us from the streets. They're like, oh, that's the All the Governor Act crew, yo, them, oh, yeah, y'all dope. And then put out, Jilda put out a song called Come Do Me, which was the R&B R &B song that had nothing to do with his whole movement, his whole sound, which is record company bureaucracy. And it basically put us back a couple of years to whereas, you know, we wasn't successful at it, because you're not gonna be successful unless you be yourself. And even, even if you are successful, by not being yourself, you won't enjoy your success because yourself will be knocking at your door. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, things, so things didn't work out. So when I came back in 1992, 93, I had my own idea. 
I understood how the game worked. I've been around a lot of rappers just from being in the industry. I've been around people from KRS One to Chuck D to Daddy Kane. All of them. I seen all of them. I seen the egos that came with it. I seen the mentalities. I also seen the um, the mistakes they was making. Uh, I had a friend of mine named Prince Paul, who um, one of the best producers of our time, I guarantee. <laughs> who, who was the only person who took the time to talk to me, work with me. Um, and show me things, right? And tell me information I need to know. You know what I mean? It was just information that, that told me, like, you know what? I'm gonna try it this way. I'm gonna switch it up. And so when I finally did sign Wu-Tang Clan and Loud Records, I was thinking in my mind, like, yo, we're gonna, we gonna give you the group, but you can have the individuals, because you now I explained it to him, it, it would be hard for him personally. You know, these guys will come up here and tear this office up, because there ain't enough money for everybody. So let us just do our thing, you do your thing, and we'll go, and it's gonna help you, it's gonna help us, and we're gonna help everybody. My plan was to get the industry to work for me. Mm -hmm. To have, you know, Def Jam, who was in competition with Loud Records, who was in competition with Electric Records and Geffen Records, to all work for the sound of Wu-Tang, work for hip hop, and eventually work together. Because, you know, they don't work together. For some reason, it's all like, who got the bigger balls? And um, one year, they all did work together. The first year that they all worked together on the campaign was in 1995. All four major labels, combined and formed the Wu-Tang family tree and put it in all the retail stores across the country. And each label doubled their sales. Mm. And even for the first album called uh, Into the 36 Chamber, which was two or three years old, had a 40 to 60% spike in sales based on that move. And so that was my goal. I achieved it, I think. Uh, and, and Did thanks. anybody copy that? I think nowadays it's copied in its own way, you know, in yeah. its own way, you know. You know, everything you're saying to me from the very beginning where after you got off the murder rap and formed Wu-Tang Clan, you had this tremendous authority and this tremendous power and this tremendous ability to control other people and to, to organize. And um, the, the, it seems the one thing in your life, as I read the book and, and thought about the things you'd done, that you weren't able to control was what happened with ODB. And ODB being your cousin yeah. who who died of a, was it a drug overdose? Was that what it was? Or? Basically, it was basically, yeah, it was, yeah, basically, you know, his body, he definitely abused his body to the point of no return. So my impression is that that's something that's really stayed with you as just a source of pain and frustration. And I wonder where you are with that now and how you've kind of worked that through. Yeah, I can speak on that. I'm going to speak twice on that. I and mean, that was the second blow. The, really, the first thing that kind of, you know, that, you know, that I guess, you know, snapped me back down in reality and actually caused Bobby Digital to kind of disappear was my mother passed away in the year 2000. Oh. And uh, I think anybody can identify your mother is like definitely your reflection or source of life. When your moms go, you kind of like, wait a minute here. You definitely know you're gonna die because that's where you came from. You know what I'm saying? A lot of us don't feel like we're gonna never die, probably. You know, we feel like, yo, hey, you know, you don't know that day is gonna come. But when it happens to, to something that close to you, it really humbles you. You know what I'm saying? It snaps you out of whatever world you're in. And, uh, it was, and there's nothing I could do about it. You know what I mean? It was one of the saddest things I ever felt in my life because I actually try to breathe back into her mouth. Mm -hmm. I mean, because my, you know, my ego and my assurity of the power of myself, you know what I mean, is like, it was super high, you know what I mean? It's like, man, shit, I'm about to make the moon jump, you know what I mean? But when you realize that, yo, you know, that we all got our physical limitations and the physical, you know, definitely got, got to suffer his death, the mental was eternal. It's, it's never going to die, you know what I mean? You're talking about Jesus 2,000 years later, so the mental was forever, but the physical is going to slip out of here. And that, that, rele that, rele that revelation for me in the year 2000 you know, brought me back down to earth and had me just go back into my studies and just go back to try to help people's minds as much as I can, not to take my whole path like this or not to take that path like that. And then when ODB, who, who basically, I looked at as an invincible man as well. I mean, I knew him my whole life and I seen him escape what you would call death 50 times or more. I mean, he was shot point blank by 357, no problem. Shot point blank by 45, no problem. Two shots, pow, pow, point blank. Goes to the hospital, climbs out the window. <laughs> I pick him up in the van, he gets in the van. Check it out, he gets in the van, 
and he has staples from here all the way up to his close to his heart. Staples, not stitches, staples. I'm like, man, he's like, man, ain't nothing. <laughs> and we actually just drove for days, went down to Virginia Beach and just, you know, I just wanted to get him out of New York and just try to get him back from the things he was doing. Because he definitely was, you know, he, he felt very invincible. He felt, you know, nothing could take him out of here. And when he did finally start saying to me, like, yo, I don't got that much longer, I didn't believe him. I mean, I was like, nah, son, you good. Said, I'm going to go before you. Nobody can kill you. you like, you know, you something special about you. And the day that, you know, he passed away, man, yo, I mean, like, that was so crazy because it's like, uh, you know what I'm saying? I was, you know, I was there, you know what I'm saying? And I had to leave to go do an interview for the one hour, one hour. I'm doing the interview, come back to the studio. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, you know what I'm saying? So that was crazy. Wow. Well, we're going to move on to a couple questions about your new career in Los Angeles. But in the meantime, anybody who has questions for Riza, there's a microphone here, a microphone here. Please just uh, line up, and we will switch back and forth and uh, take questions. Don't be shy, because you're going to go home tonight and think you wish you asked the questions. So please uh, come on up to the microphones. And uh, we'll start right in with you here. Oh, yeah. My name is Malik, man. Respect Malik. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just narrow it down to two. <laughs> um, I read your book. Pardon? I, I, I read your book. That's right. And uh, it was beautiful. Um, as far as the songs, you put the lyrics. I forgot which chapter it was, but uh, I agreed with, I think you had two songs per album pretty much. That was the formula. Yeah, I was kind of... Gotcha. Because yeah. I, I know you could put more on, but you had to streamline it. But anyway, uh, the Iron Flag, you chose, what was it, uh, Rules. I understand why you chose Pinky or Uzi, Pinky Ring. But uh, I kind of wanted to, for you to expand on um, why you chose Rules, say, over Babies. Because that had potent lyrics. I think Rules was one of those songs that um, a lot of, I was up-tempo. You know what I'm saying? And that's actually a song I didn't produce. It was produced by Mathematics. And as far as me having so much, uh, you know, I, got, I'm, I was already, I'm, you know, I'm the rhythm, I'm always famous. Mathematics is not famous yet. I'm the type of person that was shared. You know what I mean? So I was like, yo, let's focus on him. Let, him, let, let people know what he could do. People know what I could do. So, so that, that's, that was something for me to let Mathematics get his time to shine. You know what I mean? Okay. Real quick second question, because we have a lot of folks, and if everybody else could just <clears throat> one, that'd be good. All right, I'll make it quick. So, uh, 1997, you did say was a crucial year. It was in my life as well. That's when I got married. Uh, the, the thing I noticed, though, was you know how you produced all the tracks from Enter the 36 Chambers all the way to Wu-Tang Forever, except right. for Fish on Ghost Right, right. On every album, I probably give somebody one track. Gotcha. One of my students, one track. Now, as soon as I bought that tape, I think it was uh, June 3rd. 97. I'm listening to a double CD. Jizza, I think he was on five songs. Yeah. And then I remember uh, reading an article where you said he was smoking a lot of weed. And to hear that coming from you, <laughs> he was kind of profound. Right. You know, no disrespect. Nah, it's but real he said though. He's smoking a lot of weed and he has hatred in his heart. And I don't know if that's true or not. Cause I, um, I don't know if I said he had hatred in his heart. Okay. But um, that's in 97, Jizza, you know, it's just like, you're the type of person he writes in his house by itself. You don't write rhymes that's like studio rhymes. I mean, he, he, he likes to sit, it may take him a month to write a rhyme because when you listen to his lyrics, one sentence is a whole book sometimes, you know what I mean? So, but when you're working on an album and a project, you know what I mean? You, you got to be ready. You got to put that energy stronger. And uh, doing Wu-Tang Forever, you know, he was in the studio a lot, but you know, smoking weed, playing chess, yo. It's okay. chilling and um, right. end up on that song. Thanks. It's Thank better. you. Yeah, go ahead. How you doing, Riza? Uh, I was wondering if you had any advice for uh, upcoming producers who are trying to bring that creative aspect of classic era hip hop to the mainstream, and um, and what, what kind of advice would you have to producers who are who are who are just getting into the industry but want to maintain that that original creative vibe of in hip hop, but still keep the DJs and the promoters happy happy. Well, it's like, yo, you got to stay true to yourself regardless because, you know, everything got a season. And so, so we just talked about earlier how MC Hammer had a season. I'm quite sure you're not producing MC Hammer type sounds, 
but it, it worked for him, you know what I mean? It took him to the moon. So everything gonna have a season. I think the best thing a producer should do is stick to your guns, yo. And when your time come, you're gonna have the abundance to, to, to dominate the times. You look at somebody like Swiss Beats or like Pharrell, when they got their turn to burn, they didn't stop, yo. And whether some people, you know, some hardcore hip hop guys are like, I don't like that, whatever. Whether you liked it or not, when he got his time to shine, he didn't stop. When I got my time to shine, I didn't stop. The only difference I can say between me and them was that when I got my time to shine, I was struck with a flood. If you, if people would have heard a lot of the music that we had before the flood, you know, maybe Wu-Tang would even stress it out a little further, you know what I'm saying? But bottom line is stay true to yourself, yo, regardless of what's going on, son. Because only you know you, you know what I mean? Only you know what you're trying to achieve. Let the rest of the world catch up. Jimi Hendrix is a great example. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question, yeah. How you doing? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, this is kind of on a tame tangent. Um, I haven't been around for long, and I haven't heard a lot, a lot of hip hop. Um, but how I see it now is the music is being devoured by bitches, bling, money, weed, and um, I mean, only a few cats are really keeping it real with themselves. You got your Kanye West here. You got your Nas here on his good days when he's not smoking weed. Um, <laughs> So I was wondering what you were doing to contribute uh, to bring back, you know, the, that that old hip hop style. You know, bring back the days when people just like uh, they battle with with break dancing. I mean, cause cause like now it's like hip hop is just putting into the kids, into the youth, the fact that you ain't got to know your brother's name. You know, what I mean, you just call him nigga. Right. And uh, I'm I'm just it, it's it's sick and it's tiring. You know. So what are you doing? to bring back to old school, people just party, just get down, and actually know each other's names. There's a lot of, there's a lot of young guys in my crew, you know what I mean, that, that, um, that we always got them in the studio working, keeping, the, keeping that raw sound, you know what I mean? But it's like we said, it's a cycle. So right now we're going through the cycle to where as we could say ignorant hip hop is dominating the airwaves and dominating the, the record sales. But at the same time though, you know what I mean? It's just like anybody who eats uh, um, unhealthy food, McDonald's. It's fast food, homie. You can eat it all day, but like the guy showed you in that movie, 30 days later, he almost died from that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so eventually you're gonna have to get some nutrition, you know what I mean? And when it's time for you to decide to get nutrition or the world want nutrition, we got, a we got an abundance of that waiting for them. Right, Let's take a question over there, yeah. Sorry for neglecting you. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I just wanna say thank you, first uh, and foremost, because I'm... Yeah. I just I just remember in uh in '93 my my older brother pushing me to tape the Wu Tang Forever and I was thinking like I was just like really not liking it at first and then I eventually got to hear it more and more and it became y'all became my favorite group so I just want right. to just say thank you but um I was at the Rock the Bells where Ghost and Ray was at just over here in San Francisco the other day. And I know you was at the LA one. Yeah. Um, they was talking about Cuban Links too. I was wondering how uh, how much you are involved with that, or if uh, you're doing the production or what. Yeah, we actually, me and Raekwon been in the studio for the last 30 days, um, putting a lot of music together for Cuban Links too. Uh, this, this is the 10th year anniversary of Cuban Links, and if uh, if, if time and <laughs> politics do things right, it will be a Cuban Link two release this year, and I will do a lot of production on it. Let's take another question there, yeah. Thank you. Um, I gotta admit, uh, before tonight, you could have walked in my living room and I would have had no idea who you were. So I appreciate, uh, <laughs> this has been fascinating. And I've always wanted to ask a big star this. Um, I assume a lot of your early work, I mean, when you're young and hungry and the things we talked about earlier, it all stems from passion and just hunger and wanting to make it to the top. And, it's, and, and, and your, your art is coming, I mean, it's just so real. How do you maintain your credibility and your connection with your audience now? I'm assuming you have a lot of money now and, and all that. And um, I mean, how do, you, how do you, quote unquote, keep it real and, and, and maintain your credibility and, and your connection with your audience? Well, first of all, um, coming from where I come from, you never got enough money because I come from a big family of poor people. You know what I mean? So, man, I, I'm, it's, my nickname is Western Union. But, yo. <laughs> I, st I stay hungry, yo, because, because I, what I have in me is more like a swordsman approach to music and a swordsman approach to hip hop. And when you got a samurai approach, you want to be the best regardless. And, 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 and there's a famous uh, samurai, uh, oh, bong bong, all right, you know what I'm saying? That, yo, you know, take years to go study by itself, yo, you know what I'm saying? 
to, to perfect this thing and then bring it to the world. So, so, so you may not always be on top in the spotlight, you know what I'm saying? And for me, you don't have to be in the spotlight. I stay hungry. I stay wanting to show what I have inside of me, show what I've experienced, and to share it with my, with, with my fans or just with my family, you know what I'm saying? First and foremost. And eventually your fans can become your family when they really understand what you're about. I stay hungry, son. And right now, trying to, you know, I'm trying to do movies and direct and all that. So I'm on a mission, yo. For real. So you hear from your family a lot, huh? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Don't forget that. All right, right here. Basically, I, I want to say thank you, too. Um, I want to let you know I came from uh, nowhere, a broken home. Your music in general, before, like, right as Into the 36 Chambers came out, man, I was, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of drugs, doing a lot of stuff, hustling, doing shit I shouldn't have been doing. And you, your lyrics, and all the woo basically brought me out of my, you know, my rut. Right. So I want to know, uh, you know, from one MC to another, you know, what do you feel about the white boy rhetoric of like MCing and like, you know, what well, people think about, you know, whatever. Let me say, I don't, I don't know, I, don't, I never heard the, the term white boy rhetoric, but far as like far as um white MCs, one thing people got to recognize, I think we don't recognize, right, because of the white black Spanish, hip hop is an American music, homie. When you go back to some of the founding fathers of hip hop, the most favorite earlier groups, let's take Run DMC, LL Cool J, who produced it? Rick Rubin. All right then? So hip hop has always been a black, white, Latin thing. Uh, Benny Medina from Cold Chillin' Records invested a lot of money into it. You go back to the Cold Crush, uh, not the Cold Crush, um, yeah, even the Cold Crush, their DJ was Puerto Rican. The Fantastic Five, um, Grand Wizard Theodore. Those, it's, it's always been all of us, you know what I'm saying? It's just that, you know, it kind of got separated at a certain year. But as far as the story of the, of, the, of the white youth in America, it gotta be expressed, homie. You know what I'm saying? Then we're gonna find our common traits. If we don't find our common traits, we're gonna always be like this. It's, it's those common denominators that make us be like, yo, that's my, that, yo. Like right now, white boy, that's my nigga, that's my nigga. Bong, bong. <laughs> it's the common traits that we have, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't think nothing is wrong with with, with no kind of MC. I mean, we recently met some MCs out of uh, South America, Venezuela, you know what I'm saying? Down hard to the core, down to the core, whole different culture though, you know what I'm saying? Whole different world, poverty stricken, speaking their word, yo. So it's universal. We gotta get this guy into politics. He's gonna, he's gonna. Oh, you want to? I don't think so. Reza for president, over here, yeah. What's happening, Rizzo? Salaamu Alaikum. It's bad. Yeah, first thing, uh, first question, like, how do you like my coat? Uh, it's a classic one right there? Yeah, yeah, it's classic, man, from Tibet. Tibetan yaks. Bong, bong, bong. Right on. But uh, first of all, man, coming from like a, a generation who's like parents who had to watch their parents walk around like the living dead on crack cocaine, you know, I was blessed to come to Islam in 1995. And so trying to listen to the radio is nothing but a bunch of cars, hoes, you know, money and stuff like that. But I'm trying to maintain my peace. And so the Wu-Tang provided that alternative to help me maintain that peace at the same time help relate to the struggle I was going through, you know, with the father that was trying to recover from right. that addiction. So um, I know you derive a lot of your, your philosophies in the Wu-Tang from different sources. So how did like Islam and the principles of Islam and like the life example of Prophet Muhammad help enhance you as an artist or as a person? Well, first of all, um, Islam is an Arabic word. It's called al-Islam, which means the peace. You know what I'm saying? And you must have peace within yourself. Then you can share peace with others. So, in Islam also is a way of life. You know what I'm saying? I know today it's considered as a religion and you, know, you got Muslim, Muslims, and Sunni and Shiites and all that. But it's a way of life. It's the, it's, Islam is actually the way of life that planet Earth lived by. So when you look at the planets and you look at Mars and the moon, they look ageless because they always submit to the will of God regardless. They have, you don't see nobody, they don't go against, only man takes himself out of that. So for me, Islam and the, and, and the Prophet Muhammad, I don't know who, who knows, how many people in the audience know about the Prophet Muhammad, but they consider him a perfect man in Islam. And when you read, when you read about this man, I just read, I just read um, his, his life story about, last year on my birthday actually, I read his life story. Man, what a beautiful man, because here it is a man who couldn't read or write, um, no knowledge of himself or whatever, but always showed the most humility, the most humbleness. They said that he wouldn't even spit on the ground. He'd spit in his own napkin so nobody else would see it. You know what I mean? To be as peaceful and righteous as him is, 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 is a beautiful strive. And so when I read his life story, it changed my life as well. You know what I'm saying? 
And even in the past, before I knew his life story, just Islam itself and, and knowing that I must always stay at peace, prepare for war, you know what I mean? It, it, I think it helped me in every walk of my life, yo. I, I first heard, heard about Islam when I was 11 years old, and, I, and I'm super fortunate to get it that, that young and to be able to absorb it into my life, yo. Respect. Thank you for that. We're here. Hi, Riza. Uh, my name is Kay. I'm from Berkeley. Thanks. I like your hat. <laughs> bong bong. <laughs> uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you because you've been a major inspiration in my life. And That's my right. question is, um, I was wondering what your favorite strain of cannabis was. My favorite strain? <laughs> Hobo County? Did <laughs> I, 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 I say it right? Hobo, I, I, I got that in my new rap, yo. <laughs> Hobo <laughs> County Kush. All right, over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> How you doing? I, uh... I grew up in a house with a lot of Beatles and Rolling Stones and uh, Peter, good. Paul, and Mary. And uh, I started listening to hip hop about 20 years ago, and it led me through all different kinds of music into jazz and funk and soul and things I had no firsthand knowledge of. And uh, it, it led me to a lot of records I would have never heard before had they not been sampled. And uh, I've gone deep, and I'm, I'm always wondering what you're listening to. And, and so I'm wondering if you could tell me, you know, top five or even top two, top two jazz, top two soul albums for you. Um, it's, it's hard for me to like to classify people because, I, because I'm a mus as a music lover, you know, one minute you could be into, into one album, then the next minute into the next album. So it's, you know, it's hard for me to say who's the top. But um, I will say some that, some that hasn't been exploited and I don't know if it will be exploited, but what I'm listening to right now, you may laugh, yo. I'm listening to Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra right now. I've been listening to that right now, studying. Because if you look at Frank Sinatra, and they did their music with an orchestra. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you know, we do our music, you know, you know, soul music was maybe three or four pieces, maybe five pieces, and hip hop is basically an electronic sampler. So being that I'm into composing and things, I'm studying Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin right now. So maybe I'll sample a few of those things and maybe I'll make a pop hit out of one of those things and maybe somebody else will though. World up. Hey, thanks for coming out to the city. I just, uh, back to the McDonald's and back to the politics. So, <laughs> no, all I hear on the radio, all you hear is the McDonald's type of music. Um, it feels like the Clear Channel uh, type thing's taking over. So where can I, what do you recommend or how can you, uh, you know, explain to me and us how we can get that to change? How we can get Clear Channel, how we can get real music back out on the airwaves to get rid of that McDonald's crap? Well, there's a couple of things I think that's going on that we all know about. First of all, you know, the internet has definitely become a strong source of music going back and forth. You know, you can find a lot of things you never heard before. You can hear your new artists. But I think public television and public radio has also been going back to giving real music. I don't know as far as real hip hop because hip hop is such a hard music to classify for adults. You know what I'm saying? So maybe until we really get into that full blown adult age to where as we make more decisions and our vote count more and we start utilizing our vote, maybe until then, you know what I'm saying? You know, we just gotta take what's, take what's out there, yo. And, and, and look and look in magazines or look to the streets and, and just try to find the stuff that you didn't, you didn't hear on the radio. Cause you're not gonna get it from the radio, y'all. You're not gonna get it. Over here? Nobody? Oh, okay. Well, you go get to the microphone. If you don't get to the microphone, we won't be able to hear you. It's right back there, okay? Oh, I'm very loud. I'm very yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It's, a, it's about time we heard from a woman, so why don't you get up there and ask your question? <laughs> yeah. I'm a oh, woman. <laughs> um, I teach art in, the, in juvenile hall, and so I had to learn about some music because, you know, I'm from Sugar Pie Honey Bunch and... <laughs> You know, twist and, twist and Shout, Isley Brothers, Twist and Shout. Um, but there were so many things I wanted to say. First thing, I want to tell you I'm really proud of you. And I feel that I can say that because I'm, I'm older than I appear. Um, but I'm really proud of you. I did not know. I knew some of your music because I'm always on a quest. Because I teach music appreciation and so... In part, I mean, I teach painting, I teach music, I teach whatever I can, however can, how can I reach you? How can I get you to tell your story? So they want to tell a hip hop story, so I'm trying to ask them. And they say, okay, get this record, but of course it has the B word and B in the hoe and the, you know, and then I have to clutch my pearls and act all offended about that. But, um, 
but I heard you on the radio. So I knew of your music, so I brought some of your music in. And then we talk about what does this mean? What does this mean? What is, you know, what is he talking about here? So we do that. But I heard you on the radio. I heard you on NPR. And I thought, listen to that brilliant man. And I was so proud of you. I had to call all of my relatives. I'm from Chicago. I had to call them. I had to call the ones in LA and say, you have to listen to this man. And they said, you are so late. We have all, you, you are so late. But then I went to New York and I met Sifu. I went looking for you there. I didn't know you were in LA. Who knew, who knew? Wow. But anyway, I'm just really, I'm pleased to see you. And you're so brilliant. And I just love that. I love the way you are speaking the truth. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Riza, um, I'm from Wu-Tang Corp. And I was just wondering, um, can I record this for them? Pardon me? Can I record this for Wu-Tang Corp? Go for it. Um, I just want to know what your ultimate goal is in life. Like, when will you be satisfied? Man, yo. You know what I'm saying? I don't think I got the answer to that question, but I think, you know, I got personal goals, you know what I mean? That, you know, which is my art and creativity and things like that. But my ultimate goal, you know, I have to say that, you know, that's God, he drives that, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I always feel like I didn't do, 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 do what I was here to do. I feel like music and, and art is so much fun and so much joy that it can't be my goal, you know what I mean? But I don't, I can't really put my finger on it. But I do have one determined idea inside myself, and I'll share it with you, you know what I'm saying? I wanna give, I wanna leave something on this world, you know what I'm saying, that could really be useful for man forever. You know what I'm saying? Same way how homie left the will, you know what I'm saying? The will is forever useful. The light bulb is forever useful, you know what I'm saying? I actually want to, maybe in the scientific world, you know what I'm saying, which I always read and study, and I, I got this thing called, uh, an essay I wrote called The Degree of Light, which I think scientists is overlooking certain things about light and magnetism. I want to leave something special like that that could really help the world for real, yo. So if I get the chance to do that, I will. If not, maybe this idea and this dream will go to my son, because my father looked me in my eye and he came to my house and was like, boy, you're living my dream. <laughs> so. Maybe my son will do it, you know what I mean? But I, that's, that's what I really want to do, yo. So like my sweater? <laughs> Can't beat that, yo. You know what well, I mean? It sounds like it's always called explosion. Be right. Before we, um, we'll take a couple more questions, but I don't want to leave without you telling us a little bit about this current chapter of your life, which is Hollywood, which is composing music, which is acting in movies, the movie coming out derailed with Jennifer Aniston. You're in it, oh, Jim Jarmusch's movie. So... The, the answer to the last question leads me to believe this might just be this phase of your life and you might move from this through to something entirely different. But tell us a little bit about this and what you're doing and where you're going with it. Well, right now I think I'm in a real, real exciting part of my life personally, you know what I mean? For the personal things that I'm aiming for. And I'm aiming to, you know, to be a successful director, you know, successful actor. Anything to do with art that I can express, I just got an unsatchable burn to do it. You know what I mean? From clothing. You see, I got on wool wear pants, wool wear jackets. Just, I just, I, I can't stop. You know what I mean? So um, right now, I'm, I've been fortunate to meet some great people in Hollywood, some great directors, some great producers, and I'm getting some opportunities. And um, I'm really enjoying it, yo. You know, you can see me um, in a movie called Derail coming out. As you can see, I, I, I wrote the Wu-Tang Manual. These type of things, it's all artistic things, and they, they burning me with a passion. You know what I'm saying? I want to relate what the brother said earlier. He said about the Prophet Muhammad and also the Prophet Moses, both, both men who I admire greatly, but they didn't find the true meaning of their life until the age of 40. And so I'm patiently waiting, you know what I mean, another five, six years, you know what I mean, to maybe hit that degree and maybe find that meaning. Right now, I'm really enjoying the art and the things I've learned artistically and expressing them. Okay. Hey, Riz, how are you doing? My name's Jovi. What up, Joe? Um, you work with Shaq on No Hooks. Yeah. And, um, are you second second but uh, are you gonna work with him again, or any other like stars outside of the rap industry? Um, I don't know if, if Shaq is making any more albums, but we definitely. <laughs> well, <man. laughs> nah, but we well, we became homies though. We became homies. We became friends, and I know some of his family members. You know some of my family members, and you know he's just all around super dude, super cool dude. You know what I mean? Um, so bang bang.
Riza, what's up with the cure? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's written, but it hasn't been spoken. You know what I mean? Um, actually, we was in the studio um, last, last week, and I pulled the, pulled the page out from the cure to record it on Cuban Link for Raekwon's album as an interlude, just to show people where my head was at. And, uh, and Raekwon was like, man, you trying to make it rain. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, so, so on, on Raekwon's next album, I have, a, I have a taste of that, you know what I'm saying? But I got that written. I don't know, you know as time goes on, I'm thinking, I was talking to my manager about this, maybe The Cure should be a book. You know what I mean? Maybe it's not something that I rap out, you know what I mean? Because it's, uh, it's very, you know, it's just kind of intricate, you know what I mean? If you don't you know, if you don't listen close to it, it's like, it's, it, it's not useful. So maybe to read it maybe better. I'm debating that, I'm debating that. I haven't, I haven't found the right music for it yet. You know what I mean? I haven't found it yet. I've been looking for it for over seven years. I haven't found the right music. So maybe it's not meant for me to, Say it. Thanks for asking that question, though, y'all. Um, last year at the Rock the Bells in San Bernardino, uh, that was the only time I ever. Remember you, yo? Yeah, I was in the front. Was... <laughs> bon, bon, what up, yo? Uh, <laughs> what up? <laughs> like at, at the end of the set, you was just saying like, who here would like to hear another Wu Tang album? And I know since the passing of ODB, like things may not look so likely, but is there still plans for that? Uh, definitely plans for that, even though. Um, ODB passed before he passed. He still has verses and everything. Like, yeah, not not just that. He was one of the biggest advocators. Rizzo, we gotta do a Wu Tang album. You gotta, do it, man. Fuck all. Excuse my language. Like, <laughs> fuck all that shit. Drop everything and do that, God. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And um, and, and right when I was listening, you know, it, 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 you know, Tom, Tom, Tom came and showed me that yo, you no, know, you gotta do things in season. You know what I mean? Or you'll miss the opportunity. But fortunately, uh, I can tell you right now, there's six members in California right now. They came to visit me for the month of July. They've been out there for a few weeks. We have been in the studio, and maybe that'll be the result of it. Thanks. Respect. Two more questions, I'm sorry. And let me just say that Riza will be signing books. He does have to make a plane back to LA tonight. If he doesn't get to sign your books, he has pre-signed lots of books. Please don't rush him when he leaves the stage. We will have an escort take him back to the table right there where books being sold. And we'd love to answer every question, but let's go for two more, yeah. Yeah, how you doing? I, was, uh, I went to Rock the Bells last year too with my friend there, <laughs> and you, you saw him. So yeah, it was like you were explaining how uh, finding good hip hop is like, a, like, a, like you're exploring something, right? And then we drove all the way here from San Francisco just to see that San Bernardino concert. And that was probably the last full set of Wu-Tang members in the concert. And I was, I was wondering how you were feeling about that, like right after the concert, because we were there, we were waiting for you for hours and we were sweating, I, sticking I to each day, other, yo. you know what I'm saying? So we were wondering, um, what, what did you feel like right after as a group, like ste stepping off that stage and how you feel now that you can't like recreate that moment? So. Well, well, one thing I did say on the DVD when, they, when we interviewed about it, this, before, this is prior, this is before we lost um, Osiris. I was like, this ain't only just something for, for me. This is a piece of history. And I think that that concert was a piece of history. Anybody who was there became part of a piece of history because um, you know that that can never happen again, yo. Yeah. But it did happen, and we and for some reason we did document it, and we do have it on DVD. So you know, I'm just I'm just grateful for that. But you're right, that can never happen again, yo. And and I kind of felt that when it happened, though. Yeah. I didn't feel it to this capacity as far as losing a member. I just felt like it was such a hard thing getting everybody to come do that concert. That it's never gonna happen again. But now it can happen again. I'm glad. I'll just say one thing about that night. You know, ODB was in a hotel that night and refused to come to the show because he had a couple of girls and he got tired. He drained himself out. He's like, I'm not rapping this for shit tonight. And I was like, man, come on, 10,000 kids waiting for you. I was on the phone coaching him out for like 30 minutes. And he was like, I'm not, I don't give a fuck. I'm not coming. I'm tired, man. Yeah. I'm not rhyming today. I'm, I'm getting pussy. I'm like, yo, <laughs> I'm like, excuse me, but he was, this, this is how real he is, you know what I'm saying? And we sent four of our other, I sent four of my cousins, who was his cousins, <laughs> uh -huh. to get him. And, that's, and they got him and brought him in and he lived it out. And he was happy he did it. And, and I'm happy that I, because I'd usually be like, I don't care, don't come. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I really put, 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 put a voice on that and, and we got that piece of history. So, and I'm glad you was there to witness. Yo. Appreciate Respect. that. Thanks. Man. Last question there. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, Coming up in your childhood, you had to do what you had to do to survive. I was just wondering, like, when you were trying to make a, a change or go through that transition in order to get the Wu-Tang Clan started, like, how did you meet the demands of 
feeding yourself and surviving, but at the same time, coming up with the financial means to further your production company? Like, how, how were you able to cope with that? Well, in the, like I said in the beginning, you know, we, we know in the beginning before I formed the production company, I just came out of a tragic situation, a very confusing situation. And that situation that I came out of was part of me dealing with the negative world. You know what I'm saying? And when um, I did have a little bit of uh, substance to maintain myself for a minute, you know what I mean? And it was that little bit of substance and that maintained myself and the bail money <laughs> that I got back, you know what I'm saying? Held me down for basically almost a year, you know what I'm saying? And, and the Wu-Tang brothers and everybody in the crew, you know what I'm saying, would do anything to make this happen, you know what I'm saying? You got, uh, there's a guy in the group named, uh, a guy named Power, who you may have seen in a movie called Black and White. Uh, he was a guy who was, you know, he sold his car. He sold his car and bought me $28,000 and dropped it on my living room floor. I was like, yo, let's do this. And he became the president of Uber and he wound up making $5 million on $28,000 investment. So it's not only what you could do sometimes, it's the people who's around you, you know what I'm saying? People who believe in you. And, 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 and if you got an opportunity or a great idea inside your mind, it's like a corporation. Sometimes it's good to go share it with other people. When I, found, when I formed Wu-Tang Production, I didn't just form it for myself. I went to so many different people in the neighborhoods, even the, even the guy who I shot, no disrespect, who I defended myself. I went to him and his boys. It was like, yo, I'm telling you, I got it. It was like, yo, just $2,000. I had a company, I had, I had shares, I had the shares and everything, y'all. Like, I signed over shares right now, yo. And they didn't believe, you know what I mean? A lot of people didn't believe, you know what I'm saying? But my man Power, who did believe, sold his car. My brother Devon, who's still CEO of Wu-Tang Production, sold everything he had, you know what I'm saying? And, and my DJ Skane, you know, chipped in a couple of grand. People was helping out, and they, they got rewarded in return as well, and, and continue to get rewarded off what we did. So it was, it was, a, it was a collaboration for us when it came to the economics show. Well, Riza, I want to thank you. What you don't know is he's expecting another child any day now. Uh. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you for getting on a plane and coming up to San Francisco. Thanks to all of you who came thank you for tonight coming out. Really for the Commonwealth for Club well. and Friends of the San Francisco Public Library. Good night. If you have to sign, you get a question. Huh? Thank you.